All right, Google Meets usually work pretty well, but you're second tonight. Let's see. Okay, so we're um, we're picking up on uh, Luke chapter 19 and uh, beginning with verse 11. So let me see. Let me get somebody to read all the way down to verse 14 to start off with. <clears throat> now, while they were listening to these things, he went on to tell them a parable because he was near Jerusalem and they thought the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. So he said, A man of noble birth went to a distant land and gave a kingdom for himself and then returned. So, calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten minas and said to them, Trade with these until I come. But the citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, We do not want this man to be king over us. And when he returned after receiving the kingdom, he ordered those servants to whom he had given the money to be called to it in order to find out what they had gained by trading. So the first one came and said, Oh, I can go in. Yeah, so, all right. So, what's the. Um, what is what strikes you first of all about this parable? It uh, rings some bells of another parable. Right. So in this case, though, instead of three uh, servants, we've got ten servants. They're each given uh, one pound. So um, and so a talent actually is. Um, Quite a bit more than a mina. So when it calls a, a when it first to it as a pound in, in the King James, it's a it's a mina, which is about three to four months worth of the average man's working pay, whereas a talent would be like maybe sixty times that amount. So it's it's quite a bit more money. But uh, in uh, verse thirteen in the King James, the the, the command is after he gives them each a pound, he says occupy till i come and i've heard try to interpret that verse in some very strange ways because they think occupy they use occupy in the normal sense like occupy wall street or occupy uh, a foreign country or something like that but occupy actually means be busy you, you know you, you it, the words like based based on the same word as occupation so in other words trade make some profit out of the money that I've given you is what that's trying to say. And uh, and then the next thing we were told is, but his citizens hated him and sent him a message, sent a message after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. So um, when it talks about him be going into a far country to receive a kingdom, that sounds very strange to us, but for the people that Christ was talking to, it would have been a little bit more familiar because in the in the Roman Empire, you had vassal kingdoms, and Herod, for example, was one of these vassal kings. And so, uh, when Herod when Herod the Great died, his sons had to go to Rome and be approved by the Senate to take their their kingdom. And actually, after after Herod the Great died, I think that he he had one successor that was given the entire kingdom but then he did such a bad job that then they split the kingdom into four parts and the part that would include jerusalem was actually put under a roman governor the rest of it was put under uh you know the, the you know the various descendants of king Herod. Uh, but so it's, that's why they're called tetrarchs because there was four parts they had three parts that they were still left to the descendants of King Herod, and uh, one part was uh, uh, the Romans took for themselves the best part, of course. And uh, so, so the image here is of some somebody who's going off to get approved so they can they can take possession of this kingdom, and uh, and then he's got citizens that don't like him, and they're sending messengers after him saying, "We don't want this man to rule over us." Well, they actually this happened in cases of certain descendants of King Herod where people would go to Rome at the same time that they would go to try to get their kingdom to tell the Romans, we don't like this guy. We don't want him to be the king. You know, we want somebody else. 
Uh, so if we talk about the uh, how this applies in terms of Christ, Christ is obviously the nobleman. And uh, so what do you think it would mean when it talks about going to, into a far country to receive himself a kingdom? Well, actually, it's after his, his death and resurrection when he ascends to heaven and goes to the right hand of the Father, so he receives his kingdom from the Father, but he doesn't return immediately. Uh, so, so this this command to occupy till I come or or you know make trade, be busy uh, till I come is basically the command that we're still under right now. We're supposed to be doing something with what God's given us and producing some kind of profit. Who do you think are the citizens that hated him? The Pharisees. The, the Pharisees. So these are the Jewish religious leaders that rejected Christ. And uh, and uh, so so they're not wanting him to be the king. We will not have this man to rule over us. So they're rejecting Christ. Um, so anyway, um, let me get somebody to read 15 to 17. And so, and so it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then he came first, saying, Master, your mina has earned ten minas. And he said to him, Well done, good servant, because you were faithful in very little have authority over ten cities so here we have the, the best servant that takes his his one pound and he, he gets a hundred percent uh or a thousand percent increase actually uh, over over what he was entrusted with and uh so he gets the the they pat on the back we would all want to hear on the day of judgment well done the good faithful servant and uh, you've been faithful in a little, you're going to have authority over 10 cities. And uh, so let me get somebody to read 18 and 19. And the second came saying, Master, your mina has earned five minas. Likewise, he said to him, you will also be over five cities. Now, in the text, it doesn't give the full praise that uh, the, the first one got, but presumably he got, he, he would, he he did good, you know. He 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 didn't get a thousand percent increase, but he got a five hundred percent increase, which is still pretty good. And um, then the, let me get somebody to read um, twenty and twenty one. Then another came saying, "Master, here is your mina, which I have kept put away in a handkerchief, for I fear you because you are an austere man." You collect what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. Okay, so there are ten of these people all together, right? But we're only been we were only talking about three of them. Um, but um, this one's each one symbolizes sort of different categories of people. You've got someone who does the absolute best, and I think it was St. Cyril of Alexandria that said that the first one represents the apostles who did the most. And then the second one represents their successors who didn't do as much as the apostles did, but nevertheless, uh, you know, serve God profitably. Uh, but this third one represents those that are lazy and don't really produce anything. And, um, and then uh, let me get somebody to read 22 to 24. Actually, uh, yeah, we'll st we'll start with uh, tw that twenty-two to twenty-four. He said to him, "Out of your own mouth I will judge you, you wicked servant. You knew that I was an austere man, collecting what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank that I am coming? I might have collected it with interest." And he said to those who stood by, take the mina from him and give it to him who has 10 minas. All right. 
and um, and then you immediately after that you have the objection of the people that, that and this is presumably the other seven servants and it says and they said uh, they said unto him lord he hath 10 pounds so he's saying you're giving the one mina to the guy who's already got 10 you know, lord why are you doing that and then the answer is for i say unto you that every one uh, that unto every one which hath shall be given but from him that hath not even that which he he shall uh, he hath shall be taken away from him and in other parallel gospel accounts the phrase is what he seems to have uh will be taken from him so it's something that he doesn't really have because he's not done anything with it so basically the point that's being made i mean in the parable the other parable that's the more familiar one it sort of emphasizes the fact that people are given more gifts based on their ability to do something with it but they're all expected to make some kind of profit but in this parable they're all given the same thing and, uh, and so what we can say is we can tell, I mean, you can see different people in the church that some people, they just have certain natural abilities that everybody doesn't have. But there is some things that we all have in common, which is just the grace of the Holy Spirit that we have in baptism and, and basic salvation. And um, the master wasn't berating the third servant because he didn't produce as much as the first servant or he didn't produce as much as the second servant. He was he was berating him because he didn't produce anything. And the second servant was basically questioning the goodness of his master to begin with. He's saying, look, you know, you're uh, you're a hard man. And, you know, so so that's the re reason why I didn't do anything about it, because I knew that, you know, you would would judge me harshly if I lost the money is probably what he had in mind. I, so I didn't want to take any chances. I just put it in this napkin. Here's what you you gave me and here it is back. And so he's making excuses for being lazy. Uh, but but the point is, and what the master says, look, you could have at least gotten interest by if you to put it in the bank, which wouldn't have been as much money as the other guys have gotten when they were producing, you know, a thousand percent or five hundred percent increase. But it would have been something. So the point is, is that it's not that we were expected to produce. Um, All right, hold on a second. Somebody's trying to get in and this is not working. There we go. All right, so, so okay. Uh, Justin, uh, you have a question? Or Ashley? Yes, Father, I, I, I feel like, um, like I, I, there are questions about usury and interest and uh, and the value uh, returned on investments here that probably uh, I, I'm, I've got I've got some confusion around that. I'm, I'm curious if, if if some of this is, is is in relation to to those questions. Is there a way that you can offer some insight into the difference between an investment and usury? Well, kind of like that when we talked about the parable of the unjust steward that uh, because he knew he was getting he was getting fired, went and, and uh, started changing the bills of people who owed money to his master. The point of the parable is not that every detail of it is something that we're supposed to emulate. So Christians have uh, historically been against usury. Uh, now. What you have to understand about the way usury worked in the ancient world is that interest was compounded very rapidly. And so it didn't take much for somebody to, to borrow some money on usury and then wind up being over their head. And then in that day and time, if you wound up owing money that you couldn't pay back, they would sell you into slavery and your whole family along with you. And so it had the it had the capacity of destroying people. And so when you're talking about what about interest in our time? Well, it is a little different the, the, the day that we live in, because for one thing, interest is usually not usurious. Now, your credit card, you can maybe say is, is usurious if you if you if you have a carry a balance because it does compound some of them compound at a ridiculous rate, and that probably ought to not be legal. But in terms of like, you know, you, if let's say you you uh, borrow money to buy a house, 
the amount of interest you're paying on that, I wouldn't call it usury because the bank is taking a risk on the loan. And, um, and actually in our culture, if a bank told you, well, I don't think you can pay the loan back, so I'm not going to give you the loan. People feel like they're being mistreated. So you actually have lawsuits where people are saying this bank refused to loan to people who are poor, people who are black or something like that. And, um, and, and so if a bank doesn't loan people, it's considered to be an injustice. Whereas in the ancient world, if you were, if you were loaning money on usury, it, it really was an evil because of how quickly it could destroy people. We don't have debtor prisons anymore, <laughs> so so uh, you can you can declare bankruptcy and walk away from a lot of your debt. So it, it is a little different. Although uh, some of our current politicians did pass a law that made it to where you couldn't walk away from credit card debt <laughs> as easily as you used to be able to. So they were looking out for the big companies and not for the little guy. But so so all that to say is I think interest is a little bit different in our time. But on the other hand, I would say that um, if you have, um, you know, somebody in the church that's asking to borrow money from you or something like that, I wouldn't be charging an interest. Um, now, on the other hand, if somebody was borrowing like fifty thousand dollars and wanted to pay it back over ten years, I think that that would probably not be fair to not charge interest because our money loses value so quickly that. Uh, uh, you, you would wind up paying back less than you'd actually receive. Uh, and that, that's another big difference about the today versus then is today we use money that loses value over time, whereas in the ancient world, they used hard currencies that actually might increase value. But they didn't usually decrease value. Uh, so so you, you, uh, if you if you lent money to somebody and they paid you back, you actually did get back what you lent them. Whereas today, that wouldn't necessarily be the case. So does that cover what you were asking? I think so. I actually do remember reading that in, in one of your blog posts now that I think about it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. But I, I don't think the point of this parable is, is that, yeah, even back then, you know, people should have been putting their money in the bank so they could get user uh, interest. I, I think the point is he's using a, a real world example that people would have been able to relate to and there's an image there of at least doing something so that you can make some money. But, but this, the meaning of this is spiritual. And the idea is that you might not be able to do as much as the first guy, but you should be at least doing something. You, you should have some, some kind of fruit to show that from what God has given you, he's given you life. He's given you, uh, grace, uh, you've got the, the, the sacraments of the church, you've got all these things available to you, and there ought to be something that you're doing to move the kingdom of God's football down the field in some kind of way. You should you should be doing something, is, is the point that's being made. Um, any other questions about that parable before we move on to the next section? <clears throat> There's actually, there's actually one more verse that I forgot because it's on the next page in, in the Bible I'm looking at here, and that's verse 27. Can I get somebody to read that? And those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them brought them here and slaughtered, bring them here and slaughter them before me. Right. So that doesn't seem like a very nice image of, of Christ. But basically what it's talking about there is the final judgment. And, and in the final judgment, people are not destroyed eternally, but they are condemned eternally. And so that's an image of that, that these people who rejected Christ are going to have, a, a, have to answer for it. Um, any questions about that before we move on to the next section? We're now getting into uh, the Passion Week section of this gospel in the next section. All right. Um, let me see. Let me get somebody to read verse 28 down to verse 34. And when he had thus spoken, he went before ascending up to Jerusalem. 
And it came to pass, he was coming nigh to Beth Phage in Bethany at the mount called the Mount of Olives. He sent two of his disciples, saying, Go ye into the village over against you, in the which at your entering you shall find a cold tide whereon yet never man sat. Lose him and bring him hither. And if any man ask you, Why do you lose him? Thus shall you say unto him, Because the Lord hath need of him. And they that were sent went their way and found even as he had said unto them. And as they were loosing the colt, the owners thereof said unto them, Why loose ye the colt? And they said, The Lord hath need of him. Okay, so if you're one of the nice things about going to the Holy Land is it's easy to visualize things like this because if you've actually been there, you, you know where the Mount of Olives is in relationship to Bethany and Jerusalem. But there's there's a brook that's usually dry that separates the Mount of Olives from the city of Jerusalem, so it's a valley. And uh, the, uh, the Mount of Olives is a good bit higher than the city of Jerusalem, so it, it actually overlooks it. But if you were coming from Jericho, and up to Jerusalem, you would pass by the Mount of Olives, and uh, so that's the scene that's that's sitting there. And the word Bethphage, interestingly, means unripe figs, which is interesting because you know when Christ comes, he goes to the fig tree that doesn't have any any figs on it, and he curses it. Although I don't think the Gospel of Luke actually records that story, but Matthew and uh, Mark do. But um, but in any case. Um, and by, Bethany, by the way, means house of dates. <laughs> uh, and uh, I went to, to uh, Bethany Nazarene College, which later, when I went there was renamed Southern Nazarene University, but it's in Bethany, Oklahoma. And they, they had a lot of fun talking about it as the house of dates. <laughs> and that's where Nazarenes would go to get married in, in this part of the country. Anyway. Um, but uh, so then Christ told him, go to the village over against you, in which uh, at your entering you shall find a colt tied, wherein yet never man sat. Loose him and bring him hither. Now, what do you think is the point of Christ riding this donkey? Because it's not like he's going a long way. You know, the, the Bethany is like a mile or, or so from uh, Jerusalem. So it's it's not a long walk, and Christ has been walking all over uh, the Holy Land, even up into Lebanon at a, a couple of points, and um, he's never, at least so far as we know, ridden a donkey uh, on any of those journeys. So why is he riding a donkey now? And he's fulfilling the prophecy of the Old Testament prophet. Right, there's prophet Zechariah that foretells. Uh, that we can read that real quick. Let's see. It's uh, chapter 9, verse 9 and 10. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, and shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, and upon a colt the full of an ass. And I will cut off, off the chariot. Well, I won't read the next verse because I guess it goes on to something that's a little. We'd have to get into some explanation, but that's the key prophecy that's that's being fulfilled. And so, this is what a conqueror would do when he would be entering into a, a, a city. He would be riding, you know, a a uh, in, particularly in the Middle East, they would be riding a, a donkey, not a war horse, but a donkey, because they'd be going through the city, being received as a as a conqueror. And um, but the other thing that the father tells us is, is the symbolism of this colt that's never been ridden before is that this represents the Gentiles. And so, so symbolically, um, Christ is, is taming the, the, the Gentile nation. And there's actually also a prophecy about this. If you go back to Genesis chapter 49, this is where Jacob is making a prophecy over his sons. And uh, when he makes the prophecy over Judah, he, among other things, says, well, well, I'll start with verse 10. But there's a few things he says before that. He says, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be, binding his foal unto the vine 
and his ass's colt unto the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes shall be red with wine and his teeth white with milk. And uh, so the father see this is a fulfillment of, of that prophecy and also the fact that he was going into Jerusalem to uh, to be sacrificed. And so that's the washing in the blood of grapes is in, in the blood of grapes being symbolic of just his, his actual blood, but also the, the the blood of Christ that we partake of in the Eucharist. Um, any questions before we move on to the next part of this? Okay. And um, let's see. Let me get somebody to read verse um, 35 through 38. Okay. And they brought him. Can you hear me okay? Oh, sorry. I, I can. Can you? No, can I'm you sorry. Hear Go us? ahead. I was, just testing, I, I was testing my microphone because I was trying to talk earlier, but it was really choppy. But you can go ahead and read if you want. It's you can go ahead. Okay. She, I think she was going to ask a question, but I'll go ahead. No, no, I was going to read. I was going to read, but go I heard someone else starting at the same time. So. Go ahead. No. Well, if you'd like to read, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. Then they brought him to Jesus and they threw their own clothes on the colt and they set Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. Then, as he was now drawing near of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And the last part of that, I think that's unique to the Gospel of Luke that it records those words. But what does that remind you of? Right, right. It's very similar to what the angel said at the time of Christ's birth. Um, so we have this familiar scene. Now, one thing you, sh you should be aware of is just that the Gospel of Luke's account of the uh, entry on, on the Palm Sunday is a little bit briefer than you find in the Gospels of, of Mark and Matthew. I think Mark might be the most full, which is unusual because Mark is the shorter Gospel and usually is brief, but in this, he gives more details in this case. Um, but uh, one thing the fathers say about the casting of the garments on the ground of the palms is that this represents the apostles uh, by their preaching, making the, 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 the way softer for the Gentiles, which are, is represented by the cult to accept the gospel. Um, let me get somebody to read verse 39 and 40. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. So, and this this gospel also is the only one that records that phrase, the stones would cry out, which is an interesting thing to, for Christ to say. Because when we talk about someone having a hard heart, we'll talk about you, you, that person has a heart of stone. But what Christ is saying is, is what, you know, if, if, if you won't praise God, then the stones will praise God because stones have less of a hard heart than you do is, is basically the point that's being made there. Um, let me get somebody to read uh, verse 41 to 44. Now, as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment, an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave 
in you one stone upon another because you do not know the time of your visitation. So this is also something that's unique to the Gospel of Luke is that no other gospel records him. They record him saying similar things to this, but not at this point where he's he's you know he's he's basically coming near Jerusalem. He's seeing the city. And he begins to weep. This is right on the heels of him raising Lazarus, and he raised Lazarus from the dead. But before he raised Lazarus from the dead, we're told that he wept, and. Uh, when when you think about that why did christ weep because he knew he was going to raise lazarus from the dead so what was he weeping about but what the father says he, he was weeping for fallen humanity that you know that this is the fate of the human race that, that that people are going to die and there's this separation so as a man he felt this the separation but as he came in and, and he saw the city he knew what was going to happen to the city of jerusalem and uh, and he and he was he was moved to tears by it. Now, the fact that he knew that the city of Jerusalem was going to be destroyed forty years later does not mean that it was something that God decreed from all eternity, and that the you know the, the Jews had no choice in the matter. God knows the future because God's already there. God's not bound by time, and uh, so He knows what people are going to choose to do. But that doesn't mean that He makes them to choose it. Uh, so they could have chosen otherwise, but he knew wh what they were going to do. And uh, and so he's referring, you know, the fact that you, you, here you, you've got Christ present. You, you've, you've, had, you've had Christ preaching it to the people of Israel for three years publicly. And uh, this is the time that the, the Jews have been anticipating for um you know really thousands of years and uh, and yet now they're blowing this opportunity they have at least most of them are because they're not responding and so when he when he says you didn't know the day of your visitation that's what he's referring to but now if you're going to apply this to yourself what we ought to be thinking about is is whether we to be blowing the day of our visitation because we all have opportunities now that we might not have in the future. And if you think back to uh, 2020, that wonderful year that we had where, you know, we had churches shut down <laughs> and uh, people weren't able to go to church. Now we have the freedom at least to go to church right now. We may not have that freedom next year. But we have an opportunity right now to do something with what we have, and we should be treating this like I need to make as much hay in the sunshine as possible because you know when, when it starts to rain, I'm not going to be able to do that anymore. Uh, so we have to take seriously the spiritual opportunities we have because we never know. And even if the world goes on for another thousand years, we don't know whether we're going to go on for another minute. So we we should never take tomorrow as granted because we just don't know. Um, and we talked about, um, the, the, you know, the day would come when the enemies of Jerusalem would surround the city. He was pretty much standing at the spot that was the main base camp of the Roman army when they were laying siege to the city of Jerusalem. And they laid siege, siege to the city of Jerusalem right before the Passover. So the city was full of people who were there for the Passover. And it was almost exactly 40 years to, you know, to, from, from the time that Christ was crucified to the time that that happened. And uh, if you read Josephus, his account of what happened, or you can pretty much read the highlights of it in Eusebius. And I think he adds a few things that Josephus doesn't record from the Christian perspective. Um, you, can, you can read that in Eusebius's history of the church or ecclesiastical history as it's sometimes translated. Uh, you know, people were so desperate during the siege that you literally had um, roving bands of, of thieves that were just bursting into people's houses and taking any food that they had. And then they might come back six hours later to see if there was anything that they'd scrounged up since then and steal that too. And, uh, and so there was one case where a woman 
got so desperate that she killed her own son and was eating it. And when they came in there, they thought, okay, you've got food, we'll hand it over. And when they, she said, okay, sure, have, you have some. You know, she was just driven almost insane by this point. And when they saw that even these hardened people left, uh, you know, and it was such a shocking thing for, for, for the people, even though they were such a desperate strait, but that's, uh, that's where they were driven to. And that all happened as a result of them uh, rejecting Christ at the day when they had the opportunity to receive him. Whereas the, the Christians, uh, because they were warned by Christ, as we read about in the Gospels, to, when you see these things flee into the mountains, the Christians didn't go into the city of Jerusalem, which normally that would be the logical thing that you do because it was considered to be a fairly impregnable fortress. Um, but there's no fortress that can't eventually be taken. And, and you know, the Romans were very... Uh, and, and you know they had good engineers and and so they, they they figured out a way to basically build an entire wall and and uh with you know with a, with a trench around the city to where they kept everybody inside so people couldn't flee and uh they laid siege to it and i think they eventually built up some sort of a ramp to get into the city too and then they and then they finally were able to take it so most of the people in the city were either they either died from the, the hunger or they were sold into slavery. A lot of the men were, were made gladiators and so died in the arena. Uh, so it just it didn't end well for anybody inside of, of the city. And so that's what he's weeping over. He's, he, he knows that this is what's going to happen. Um, let me get somebody to read uh, 45 through 48. Then he went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in it, saying to them, It is written, My house is a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And he was teaching daily in the temple, but the chief priests, the scribes, and the leaders of the people sought to destroy him, and were unable to do anything, for all the people were very attentive to hear him. Okay. So, um, again, you have a very brief account here of the cleansing of the temple. You'll get more information about this if you read uh, Matthew or Mark on the subject. Um, but um, basically what had happened was, and when, when we talk about the cleansing of the temple, you shouldn't think that this happened inside the main structure of the temple, which is where the sacrifice took place, because only the priests and the Levites went in there. So there, that there would not be a whole lot going on in there other than the actual worship service. But surrounding the uh, central uh, temple, you had various courts. You had the court of uh, the priest. You had the court of... Uh, the men, you know, the court of the women, and then you, the outer court was the court of the Gentiles. And uh, so you had many Gentiles who became believers, but they didn't convert to Judaism. Partly, a lot of men especially didn't convert to Judaism because to convert to Judaism involved being circumcised, and that wasn't a very appealing thing to most men uh, to undergo. But but uh, they, were God, they were known as God-fearers. And so their only access to the temple was in the court of the Gentiles, which the equivalent in the church uh, today would be the narthex. You know, that's that, because in the early church, if you weren't uh, if you weren't baptized, you couldn't go beyond that point. And um, so, so the Gentiles could go in there and they could worship God. But what had happened was, is this particular year, they had moved the. Uh, uh, the money changers and and the, and the people who were selling sacrificial animals into the court of the Gentiles, and that could have been because the the temple of, of Herod the Great was actually still under construction. The main building, of course, was done, but there were things around the temple that had not been finished. It was only like nine years before the temple was destroyed that it was finally complete. Um, so. So there might have been something that was going on in terms of the construction that caused them to say, let's go ahead and move these things over here. Now, the fact that they had money changers and that they were selling things was not in and of itself a bad thing. 
because the law of Moses said, well, if you live at a long distance, you can change your sacrificial animals for money where you're at, take your money to Jerusalem and then buy one there, rather than trying to take an animal on a long trip that they might not survive. And, um, and by the time of Christ, you had Jews that lived at very long distances. And so for them to make you know, a trip, say, from Babylon all the way to, uh, to Jerusalem with an animal, that, you know, that they would offer a as a sacrifice, that animal certainly would make it uh, the way the people traveled back in those days, at least not without blemish of this being, being upon the animal. But the problem is where they were doing this. And so they were actually blocking out um, the access that the people had. And um, in one of the other gospels, the Christ says, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it into a den of thieves. So, so he, that, that, that's emphasizing the fact that this is a house of prayer for all nations, and you're cutting off all the nations from coming into the temple because it's the only place they can be, and you're doing all this stuff in there. Luke doesn't mention him getting out a whip or overturning the money changers' tables, but you do find that talked about in the other Gospels, so that certainly was what happened. And then... It says he taught daily in the temple. Um, now, during Holy Week, we Holy Week begins with Lazarus Saturday. So on Lazarus Saturday, we commemorate the raising of Lazarus. The following day is Palm Sunday, so we rec we commemorate the triumphal entry. And of course, you, you the the next big commemoration is Holy Thursday, which commemorates the the uh, institution of the Eucharist, as well as the betrayal of Christ, Friday, the, the, the crucifixion, Holy Saturday, the, the, the burial, and, the, and the, the lamentations, and then, of course, Pascha. But Holy Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday tend to not get as much attention. But one of the, what's, one of the things that we do when we do the full cycle of services, which we've been able to do for several years now, is um, the entire Gospels, if you do what the Typicon says, you read all four Gospels during the hours of, uh, the, of those three days. And that's commemorating Christ's teaching in the temple because that's what he was doing on those days was he was teaching. We have some excerpts of his teaching in, in the Gospel accounts, of, you know, the things that he was teaching in the temple. But, uh, but when you're sitting in church on those days and you're hearing the gospels being read, uh, you, you, you should be thinking of yourself as, as if you were back in the temple listening to Christ teach because that's what that's commemorating. Now in our practice, for practical reasons, because it'd be a lot you know, to try to do all four gospels in three days in, in the hours, what we do is we do a different gospel every year. And uh, the first year we did it, we did the gospel of Mark because that was the year that I retired from the state. And so I only got to do Holy Wednesday because I had to, I retired on Holy Tuesday. <laughs> and uh, uh, so we picked Gospel of Mark because it was the shortest Gospels, but we did it all in one day. So it still made for a long service. Uh, well, now this year we're wrapping back around to the Gospel of Mark. So that means we're going to spread the Gospel of Mark out of three days. So it's going to be a little lighter of, of a load than the other Gospels are. Uh, so if you if you can make it to those services, I would encourage you to do it because there are pre-sanctified liturgies served on each one of those days. You get to take communion, and uh, and you get to hear the entire Gospel of Mark read this year. So that would be nice. Any any questions about uh, chapter nineteen before we move on to? I had a question. Okay, yeah, sure. Um, I don't know where I'm pulling this from, but wasn't there some outrage as far as the exchange for temple coin or something along that lines? I don't know where that's coming from in my head. Because you had to have temple coin as opposed to regular standard coinage, and you had to exchange that, and they were charging like high rates. But somewhere that's in my mind, I don't know. Yeah, and there is records of that and people complaining about that. Now, on the one hand, you can say, well, I guess the temple you know, needs some, some, some to, to make some money and all of this stuff. But but they were kind of gouging people with that, and uh, and and that's the reason why Christ talked about is you turned it into a den of thieves because the stuff that they were doing was not entirely honest. <laughs> yeah, I don't know where I even 
pulled that information from somewhere obviously I read somewhere. But also the people who were selling animals, I think there was there's some records of people complaining that uh, they were being charged way more than what they were worth because they kind of had a corner on the market. You know, here you you want to you want to land without blemish, where are you going to get? <laughs> you know, go go shop if you want if you want somewhere else. So yeah, they, that was that was part of the whole thing. Okay, let me get somebody to uh, read <clears throat> verses one through four of chapter twenty. Now it happened on one of those days, as he taught the people in the temple and preached the gospel, that the chief priest and the scribes together with the elders confronted him and spoke to him, saying, Tell us by what authority are you doing these things, or who is he who gave you this authority? But he answered and said to them, I also will ask you one thing, and answer me. The baptism of John... Was it from heaven or from men? So, so the Pharisees basically um, thought that they were in the chief priests. They thought that they were going to catch him with this because they they basically were wanting him to say what he was all about, basically. And they were hoping that he was going to claim to be the Messiah, so they could say, "Well, that's blasphemy, no way," or whatever. And uh, and Interestingly, Christ didn't give him a direct answer to that question, which I think there's one lesson that we could learn from that, and that's that when we're dealing with people who are not asking honest questions, uh, we shouldn't always feel like we need to give an honest answer to dishonest questions. Uh, I think I think turning questions back on people like Christ did is, is, a, is a reasonable thing for us to do. Um, when people are asking, really asking honest questions, that's another story, of course. Um, let me get somebody to read verses 5 through 8. And they reason, <clears throat> and they reason among, among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why then did you not believe him? But if we say from men, then all the people will stone us, for they are persuaded that John was a prophet. So they answered that they did not know where it was from. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. So basically, he, he, he asked them a question that basically exposed them because they knew that almost everybody believed that St. John the Baptist was a prophet. But they rejected John, and, uh, and Christ knew that. So he's trying to get them to fess up to what they really believe. And uh, they knew that. You know they were going to be in trouble no matter what they said <laughs> if, they, if they said no we don't believe that then people might have stoned them as they as they suspected but if he if he had said yeah we believe he was a prophet then okay well you're hypocritical but he certainly didn't speak anything in his favor when he was alive uh, so they just chose to just not give an answer which, which when you're thinking about these people are the religious uh, religious authorities of, uh, of the land and uh, this is a pretty basic question that you know wasn't something that would not not have been aware of, you know who was John the Baptist, and they couldn't give an answer to that question because they were they couldn't give an honest answer to that question. So Christ exposed them, and he didn't say you know, he didn't say well I'm the Messiah that's why I have this authority because he he, uh, he wasn't going to give an, he he wasn't ready to reveal himself to them yet. Now later on when he comes before the Sanhedrin he finally does put it all out there, but at that point he's ready to uh, to, do, to do so. So he does it in his own time and not the time of their choosing. Let's see, we got uh, we got three minutes. Well, maybe, unless there's an objection, we can go maybe a few minutes beyond eight since we had some hiccups at the beginning. And let's go ahead and cover the, uh, the, the parable of the uh, stewards of the vineyard. Um, Let me see. Let me get, well, uh, let me, let's just get somebody read 9 through 16. Then began he to speak to the people that the parable, a certain man went to the vineyard and let it forth the husband. 
and went to the far country for a long time. And at the season, he sent a servant to the husbandmen that they should give him of the fruit of the vineyard. But the husbandmen beat him and sent him away empty. And again, he sent another servant, and they beat him also and entreated him shamefully and sent him away empty. And again, he sent a third, and they wounded him also and cast him out. Then said the Lord of the vineyard, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. It may be they will reverence him and they see him. But when the husbandmen saw him, they reasoned among themselves, saying, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, that the inheritance may be ours. For they cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. What therefore shall the Lord of the vineyard do unto them? He shall come and destroy these husbandmen and shall give the vineyard to others. And when they heard it, they said, God forbid. Okay. So, um, what does the vineyard represent? Well, the, specifically the church of the Old Testament. And there's a lot of times in the Old Testament when the people of Israel are referred to as being a vineyard um, or the Lord's vineyard. And in the hierarchical liturgy, there's one thing the bishop says that only the bishop says. That's what you don't hear it every Sunday is, uh, oh, Lord, look down upon this vineyard. You know, it's a prayer that he says where he's basically asking God to bless this vineyard uh, being the church. And um, so this is the church of the Old Testament. And the husbandmen are the people of Israel. And um, let's see. And so the people of Israel are, are given the rev this revelation. They have, the, they're, they're given the temple. They're given um, the Old Testament sacrificial system. They're given prophets. And just like when we think about the parable of the, uh, the, of the ten stewards, we have uh, people who are not producing any fruit. They're at least not that they're willing to share, because the imagery here is 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 the the Lord is expecting something from them, some sort of fruit, in response to the thing to everything that they've been given. And instead of them bearing fruit, um, they're they're rejecting the messengers that that the master is sending. To try to get them to start sending, you know, bearing the fruit to, for for God to repay him for the kindness and the mercy and the grace that He's shown them. So, so all these these first set of uh, servants that are sent to them represent the Old Testament prophets. But then at the at the last, He says, "Well, I'm going to send My Son. You know, perhaps so reverence Him." So this is the incarnation where Christ comes. But when they when, when these husbandmen see this. They, they decide, look, here's the heir, let's kill him and we'll seize on his inheritance. And they cast him out of the vineyard and literally Christ was taken outside of the city of Jerusalem and, and killed. And, uh, and so the question that Christ asked them is, what, what is the Lord of the vineyard going to do? And in some gospels, you actually have the people responding and saying what Christ is summarizing here. He shall come and destroy those husband and shall give that vineyard to others. So at least, it, there, I mean, this could be Luke sort of making the story a little bit simpler and not getting into the people's response because he wanted to highlight another response, which the other gospels don't record. Because um, we have a different response here. It says, when they heard it, they said, God forbid. Who's, who's the people saying God forbid? Is the scribes and the chief priests? They're hearing this. They're hearing this parable, and they're, and they're saying, "You know, we we know who you're talking about here." <laughs> and may it never be. Literally, I mean, King James says, "God forbid." But the Greek literally says, "May it never be." And um, so, when he lets out the vineyard to, to other husbandmen, what what that the fathers say about that is that's representing the the New Testament church, the apostles, and also the church of the Gentiles. And so, basically. Uh, these people are getting the drift that, okay, this means your days are numbered. <laughs> you, you, you've not done what you were supposed to do with this vineyard, and it's getting ready to be handed over to other people. Um, and then, uh, so Christ uh, says a few more things here. Let's, let's go ahead and get somebody to read verses 17 through 8, 19, and, uh, and then we'll wrap up. Then he looked at them and said, What then is this that is written? 
The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Whoever falls on that stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind them to powder. And the chief priests and the scribes that very hour sought to lay hands on him, and they, and they feared the people, for they knew he had spoken this parable against them. Okay. And I think, you know, maybe next time we'll pick up actually at, at, uh, at verse 16 and talk about the psalm verse because I, I actually don't remember what the fathers had to say about this because I didn't think I was going to get this far into the, the chapter. Uh, and I, I don't want to give that short shrift because I think I know what, what Christ is saying here when he talks about whom it falls will be broken, but on whomever it falls, they'll be ground to powder. But I would rather spend some time reading what the fathers have to say and talk about it more fully and not just pass over it lightly. Um, so any questions before we wrap up? Okay, let's go ahead and say the closing prayer. <laughs> it is truly meet to bless thee, the fair tokos, ever blessed and most famous and mother of our God, more honorable than the cherubim, and beyond compare more glorious than the seraphim, who without corruption gave us birth to God the word, the very fair tokos need we magnify. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, everybody.